May the 6th, 1939, a memorable day in England's history, as from Buckingham Palace, their majesties ride in state to begin a history-making journey. They arrive at Waterloo Station, where the royal train awaits. The Queen Mother is here to see them all. She will watch over the royal children. The Prime Minister, officials of state, and the royal family come to wish them Godspeed. On leaving London, the moment of departure is touched with the sadness of farewell. At Portsmouth, off British soil and on to the great white ship, the Empress of Australia, their majesties embark. The mighty home fleet salutes its king and queen as the ship gets underway, headed for the open sea and days of rough weather, fog and ice. Then up the wide St. Lawrence to Quebec. From every vantage point, the crowds cheer as the ship moves to her dock. It is at Wolfe's Cove, under the Plains of Abraham, that a reigning British king and his queen step for the first time in history on the Dominion soil and the American continent. They are officially greeted by Canada's Prime Minister Mackenzie King and officials of state. Old world pomp and ceremony in a new world setting. A royal reception is held on the flag bedecked dock as many admiring subjects for the first time meet their manly king and charming queen. From now on they keep constantly on the move for all the provinces await their coming. Montreal is the next city to receive them and they win the hearts of everyone, a moment that none will ever forget, hours of standing and waiting just to see them pass, an occasion that may never occur again. At the Windsor Hotel, they greet the calling crowds in the streets below, half French, half English, but loyal subjects all, who now acclaim their sovereign and his consort. Then on to Ottawa, the capital of the Dominion. At the Parliament building, the King and Queen sit in state. Later from the steps of the main entrance, the King reviews his troops. Bidding adieu, they leave the troop line square with all the pomp of ancient pageantry. May the 20th is decreed the king's official birthday so that the traditional trooping of the colors may take place. The queen and Lord Tweedsmuir watch from a window as the king inspects the resplendent troops below. The royal grenadiers of Montreal and the governor general's foot guards go through the impressive drill that London knows so well now performed for the first time in this hemisphere. The king takes the salute. It is the queen's day too, as she lays the cornerstone of Canada's new Supreme Court with a golden trowel. Then their majesties greet the stonemasons with a handshake of true democracy. They leave the platform, and to the great concern of their bodyguards, they informally mingle with the crowds to speak and walk with all. The awed respect and devotion of their subjects are heartfelt and sincere. Without freedom, there can be no enduring peace. Without peace, there can be no enduring freedom. With these closing words, the king dedicates the magnificent National War Memorial in Connaught Square. Again, their majesties step down to walk among the crowds. They meet and speak with many World War veterans. Their stay in Ottawa has been a busy one, but every hour of their time is marked, and they say goodbye. The king is fond of fine horses, and at Toronto's Woodbine Track, the king's plate, a classic race, is to be run. Their majesties enter the royal box. And they're off. The favorite takes the lead. Thousands that cheered royalty now cheer the speeding horses as for the moment the attention turns from the royal box. Archworth holds the lead. He seems to know that he runs for watching royalty. And ten lengths ahead, he crosses the finish line in a race run for a king. His Majesty presents the cup. The long tour across Canada to the west coast is begun. A stop is made at Banff where the king and queen, for the first time, look out on the might snow-covered Canadian Rockies, a quiet interlude in their eventful journey. There is no lovelier view in all the British Empire than these towering snow-clad peaks of the Great Divide. 
In the far west, many picturesque Indian tribes welcome the great white father and his queen. For the first time, they see reigning royalty. The king and queen enjoy this interesting and colorful occasion. Finally, they reach the Pacific coast, and flag-bedecked Vancouver greets them. In Memorial and Dunbar parks, they are cheered again by thousands. Soon they must travel back across the continent for their visit to the United States. Having crossed the international border at Niagara, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, representing the United States, accompanies the royal train to Washington. In the gala reception room of the magnificent Union Station, the heads of the world's two greatest democracies shake hands, and history is made with reigning British sovereigns for the first time in the capital of the United States. The trip to the White House begins. Pennsylvania Avenue is accustomed to great occasions, but this is the most unusual of them all. Through cheering crowds, the official cars move slowly along. The Queen rides with Mrs. Roosevelt, and they chat like old friends. The skies are clear and the sun is hot, and on to the White House, and more planned ceremonies are just ahead. At a garden party in the British Embassy grounds, Sir Robert and Lady Lindsay present distinguished guests to the royal hosts. The king and queen informally greet friends, old and new. J. Pierpont Morgan, an old friend of the royal family, is present. A typical English garden party. On the portico, the king and Mr. Morgan enjoy a chat. Washington in June is hot. In the high dome rotunda of the Capitol building, senators and congressmen, the nation's lawmakers, are presented with their wives to King George and Queen Elizabeth. The royal party reaches Mount Vernon, once the home of the first president of the United States. The king places a wreath within the simple ivy-covered tomb of George Washington as a symbol of a British sovereign's respect and of Anglo-American friendship, expressing a bond of peace between the two great democracies. Returning by way of Arlington, a visit is made to the white marble tomb of the unknown soldier. With impressive ceremonies, the king places a wreath in memory of the American soldiers who perished in the World War. We seem to hear the words, let us have peace. From the Jersey Shore, aboard the destroyer Warrington, their majesties move up the bay to see Miss Liberty and the towering skyline of Lower New York. They arrive at the battery for the official civic welcome and are met by Governor Lehman and Mayor LaGuardia. The royal party begins a 46-mile tour of the city. All New York is lined up to see them pass. Their route is along the West Side Express Highway and on through Central Park, then out across the city. Firing and cheering millions give them the typical rousing welcome of New York. Noisy, enthusiastic, and sincere. The climax of the royal visit to the United States is at Hyde Park, where their majesties spend a memorable weekend at the home of the president. Here they relax and informally chat with Mr. and Mrs. Roosevelt and the president's mother. friendly and pleasant finale of an epoch-making chapter in Anglo-American history. Goodwill Ambassadors from the Old World to the New.